the January 23rd um, study session of the Littleton City Council. We have a full council, and it appears as though we have almost a full planning commission. We are doing a joint meeting with the planning commission um, to discuss the draft mineral stationary framework plan, and that's how we'll start our meeting off. Um, welcome to the planning commission. Glad to have you here. Um, Jocelyn, are you going to lead the presentation? Yes. I okay. Um, do you want to? Do we have some newer planning commission folks, or are we good to just go right into it? Um, I think let's go right into it, and let's. When you have a question or you want to talk, give us your name, and we'll just get going that way. We all have name plates. Okay. We've got a lot to talk about. We don't know and names. <laughs> So I'll get it started, and um, but honestly, it's really about your conversation. But I put a few slides together so we at least get some background and um, context to the discussion tonight. But yes, it's talking about the mineral station framework. Um, and please note, we're calling it a framework that's based <coughs> on planning commission direction to not really call it a plan, but really focus around the concept of framework. So. Um, just quickly, here's a general overview of the study area. As you know, it's the mineral station RTD light rail is the center point, if you will, and then it goes out quarter mile to half mile from that area. Um, quickly, some background. Um, so, as we know, in 2013, we, the city did get a grant for uh, master planning for both of our station, our light rail stations. Um, we did decide to move forward with the mineral station first. So, 2015, 2016, we hired the firm of Puma to help with that planning process and the community engagement happened in 2016. Um, the main issues that came out of that, as we know, were parking and traffic. In early 2017, we learned um, that RTD needed to rewrite our contract for the station planning, and we're still in process of getting an updated um, IGA on that. And then um, in December of 2017, um, we brought the topic to council, and the direction was um, at that this time it's premature for master planning of mineral, but really um, directed staff to create a framework plan with goals and action steps based on that community engagement that had happened during. 2016. Um, and from there, January 8th, the Planning Commission had a study session about the draft plan, um, and they had several comments and constructive ideas and feedback, so all of that has been incorporated into the draft that's before you this evening. Um, so quickly, just to give you the context, so the table of contents, um, Planning Commission did ask that we do an executive summary that's not written yet. Um, but we're working on that. Um, but the, the, the layout is an introduction. Then really, as you all recall, it's a, um, we needed to have some information about the, the PEL, the Planning and Environmental Linkages study that the city is initiating with regional partners and CDOT, um, because that's a big piece of this planning area. Um, so there's a whole chapter in the framework dedicated to that concept. And um, then chapter three, really talking about the existing conditions that we have out there, and that's within that whole um, half mile radius of the study area. Um, and then really it was about four main topics that came out of the 2016 community engagement, transportation, recreation, open space, parks and trails, character and design, and land use. So those are the what create the rest of the framework document. Um, and then we have some attachments to just for the context of the overall project itself. There was a market assessment that was complete in 2016, um, as well as in 2016, that community engagement. We had had a presentation to the Planning Commission um, in November, <coughs> excuse me, summarizing all of the comments we received. Sorry about that. <coughs> um, so with that, I'm not sure how exactly you guys want to break this down. I, Trying to be make this simple for the presentation piece, I lumped these three um, chapters together, and then the next slides are just an individual slide on, like I said, the four topic areas. <coughs> Excuse me, transportation, parks, open space, character and design, and land use. So, um, I want to just talk about it now, or how? Jocelyn, could you back yes. up just a little? Could sure. you um, set a little bit of framework as to what? your expectation is um, to come out of this meeting with? Are you looking for direction? If so, um, 
would. What are the? Sure. Yeah. And I can finish with the presentation too if you want to just finish that. Um, so, like I said, these are the first three chapters, really focusing around the context for the plan and how we want to use it. And really, <coughs> the idea is to use it as we make future decisions in this area of the city. Um, this is a document we want to be a reference and a guide um, to help direct some of those decision making. So that was the intention of the first three chapters. Um, and then like I said, then really there's a section here about transportation where we laid out specific goals and action steps. So that, and again, it was really trying to create framework around the community engagement and putting it in a context that we could use this framework for moving forward and helping us making decisions for this area of the city. Um, the second one, um, or the, I think it's the sixth chapter, is on recreation, open space, parks, and trails. Um, I guess backing up, as you know, from that community engagement, there was a lot of agreement about parking and traffic and those issues that we really need to figure out solutions for first, because that has an impact to both the, the land and property itself as well as that whole area. Um, so transportation, parking, and um, traffic were the big things. And then the other main agreement amongst that community engagement was the importance of the open space and um, you know the Carson Nature Center and the South Platte Park and the river in this area and that and that unique connection that the mineral station has to those um, recreational and open space amenities. Um, and then a, sec a section on the character design. Um, and then lastly, some goals and action steps around land use. I have a question about the yeah. bridge. Is there a likelihood that it will be moved? It, it did just barely touched on that. Is it actually possibly that we could end up having to move that sometime? Or? Possibly, yes, based on, you know, like next steps we have to figure out with the intersection um, and the improvements to the mineral um, and Santa Fe intersection, potentially, that did come up. You know, so that would be, there's some action steps and some direction in the document relative to if that needs to move, you know, sort of what the input was from the Is it something that could be moved or just brought down and then a new one? I, I don't, we didn't get to that level of the conversation. It was just knowing that the bridge is there and um, with what may have to happen with the improvements at intersection, it may impact that. I don't know if you want to add anything, Mark, to that. Yeah, I would add uh, my estimation based on probably the work of the DEL, it's likely that bridge will move. So again, we haven't really gotten to the detail of what that truly means or how that might happen. But my guess, just based on what I've seen of the preliminary design work that the city did here some years ago, I think it's likely. Which direction? Yeah, that's a great question. I don't know. <laughs> to the left. Oh. <laughs> I don't know which way you're standing. OK, thanks, Jerry. Down. If I may, just uh, backing up just a second, maybe to the to the mayor's question here. I think the intent of this evening here is for us to kind of share the outline or the, this framework and see if we have consensus among the council and the planning commission in order for this to move forward here for a public meeting and then eventually come back through the formal process here from the planning commission and city council for um, adoption. Is that fair to say? That is correct. If you get right to that. Oh, there we go. <laughs> so, yes. So, if we get the direction to move forward from this group, the next step would be to have an open house on this draft framework. Tentatively, we have that scheduled for the 15th, as well as some online um, engagement. And then based on that, it will either be two planning commission for a study session to go through what those comments were and um, figure out how to... Um, you know, add that into the document itself, or if it's everyone's in agreement, you know, we may be able to just bring it forward right to the formal process, which would be to go to planning commission for a recommendation and city council decision making. But that's the. That. Karina, um, you talked about um, once this is formally adopted, the purpose of it is to guide decision making. So for it to guide decision making, does that mean we would adopt this as part of our comprehensive plan? We would adopt it as a 
as a plan. I don't know that it honestly, I mean, it's in the context of the comprehensive plan, one of the, I believe, one of the plans we were supposed to take on was a light rail station master plan. This isn't functioning as a master plan. Um, but whether, I guess that's maybe a question for the attorney, but whether it's connected to the comp plan or not, it would be an adopted plan so that can be used. And that's for, a, I'm, I'm, I want to ensure that we can use it as a decision making, not just guidance. And it is enforceable. Uh, council, right now it would be an adopted plan. Now one of the things that a number of cities in Colorado as well as other parts of the country do is they actually develop elements in their comprehensive plan that address specific points. And one of those elements would usually be a circulation element that would look at all the different forms of transportation and this would then be incorporated as part of that circulation element as well. And so it will be an adopted plan and as we move into uh, the uh, comprehensive plan through the uh, visioning process, that will certainly be a policy decision for the council to consider whether it wants to uh, develop specific elements and then this would be incorporated in the uh, circulation element uh, in that plan. Do you mind me? Oh, I'm sorry. I, I was just going to actually reinforce what the city attorney said. Based on my experience, the adoption of this plan would feed into ultimately the conversation about the element of a transportation master plan. So once you have a comprehensive plan, in essence it's kind of a future land use map, um, you test that uh, with a transportation master plan to make sure you have a network system that can actually manage that future land use map. And so an element like this then would be part of that process to establish a transportation master plan. Mark, do you want to give a, a little bit of a summary of um, the planning board, or the planning commission? Thank you, Colin. And happy birthday. <laughs> and happy birthday to Chair Renecki. Oh, thank you. Uh, happy <laughs> birthday. Good we to got be good good uh, birthday. not talking off my uh, council representative. Uh, <laughs> um, kind of give us an overview of, of your conversations. That'd be great. Um, well, just uh, just personally, it's it's it's. Uh, I think I speak for the commission. Uh, glad to see this moving forward. It, uh, we spent a lot of time on it uh, back in. Uh, 2016 and then it of course died for over a year and the fear was that we were losing momentum we were losing uh, um, losing the input from the uh, citizens uh, that came to all the, th the two meetings at uh, Carson Nature Center and then the meeting in council chamber with the little clickers um, so it's, it's it's good that that hasn't been lost um, I think we uh, agree that it is this is not a it's not a master plan. There's not a great amount of uh, finite detailing here that can be used, uh, you know, uh, to uh, instead of a standard or a guideline. It's 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 very very general here, and it, it done so on purpose. It's a framework plan. It's meant to give a little bit of uh, of uh, umph to what the what our city wants when we're dealing with uh, C dot in their in their look see on the entire corridor from what Denver all the way to. Uh, probably to uh, Castle Rock uh, along, uh, along Santa Fe. So that's the purpose of it. Uh, and, and also the purpose, of, again, not to lose the uh, community input and, and, and all our information that, uh, uh, that uh, the Planning Commission and staff have put together. So um, uh, we have uh, looked at, uh, I think, a couple of versions now of, 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 the, uh, of the draft here, made our comments, and I, I can speak for myself. I'm happy with how it's... Uh, how it's coming along worded. Uh, like to get your input. Uh, uh, personally, I wanted to be more finite, especially uh, in my profession, uh, design. I wanted to get into design more, more standards, but uh, I was shooed away from doing that, and, and I understand the reason behind it. So that's, again, a little bit of overview from uh, Planning Commission. Yep. Comments, questions? Uh, yeah, I have a few. Maybe. Yeah, I I just have an observation. I'm not meaning to be a whale sport, but I've been here since um, 68. And there were plans for a lot of things. We were going to have this project, and it was going to have this outcome, etc. Repeatedly, things that we've planned for have turned out different. They've morphed into something else. 
And so I'm trying to figure how much we should be trying to commit and how much we should maybe focus on what we hope will be transportation corridors and address those and then let let happen what happens with the, where the money the developers have want to take us or at least propose to take us. Uh, I'm just tossing that out there as a something for somebody to bat back at me with lots of wisdom. Well, my fear has always been uh, uh, in the previous three or four or five years, we've been more of a reactive commission rather than a planning commission. I want to get ahead of the game, personally. I think our commission wants to do that as well. Uh, so when a developer comes in, he has, uh, he has guidelines. He has standards for uh, what, what he could do uh, on the Santa Fe corridor. It's that important to us. It's the most important piece of the whole puzzle of Littleton. <coughs> I always say that Santa Fe uh, corridor, the eventual corridor study that we need to do is number one, number two, number three on the hit parade. Uh, everything else is five, six, and seven. That's for the city. It's our best opportunity and our, uh, and our most uh, dangerous area uh, for the future of the city. So uh, I want to, I think our commission wants to get ahead of the game eventually. This is a start uh, when CDOT finishes their review of Santa Fe. Uh, immediately get into the corridor study, uh, redo of the corridor study that uh, Jerry and I were involved with, good grief, what, 15 years ago, something like that? Uh, 98. Yeah, so uh, get into that and, 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 and redo, uh, update uh, the, uh, the corridor study. So um, I don't want the developers, I mean, they have use by rights up and down the corridor, but I, I want an uh, uh, overview. Um, Guidance, guidelines, standards in place when this development is going to happen. When, when does CDOT expect to have any information? A couple of years. It's, it, it's, it's going to be quite a delay. Yeah. Okay. Is that correct? About two year process? Yeah, yeah it is. It, at least it's, it's started, but. Yes. Our public works director was here just a second ago, but yeah, it's, it's going to be probably a two year process. In fact, Keith Reister, where's is Keith here? <laughs> he just snuck out. Just snuck out. All right. uh, Keith has been working pretty diligently the past month here with CDOT trying to uh, you know, formalize the schedule, the commitment. Uh, but it is, a, I think, in this particular corridor, it is going to be a two year process. So, and I would, oh, go ahead, Peggy. So, Mark, clarify for me again, because it seems to me what, when you say standards, I'm not hearing that directly in this. We don't, we don't have standards in here. We don't have standards here. And so I don't object at all to the standards piece. I mean, that a lot of that land out there has... Um, <laughs> you were summoned. Did you hear Did you hear us calling? <laughs> you know, you guys are important, but my son called, so... How that works. All of you that are parents. So. Uh, yeah. There was a question regarding the timeline with the CDOT study at this point, sure. a couple of years. Sure, I can answer that. Um, uh, the, hopefully in the next week. Um, so the way we have it set up, a planning and environmental linkage study, um, which is what we talked about short, we call it PEL, which really looks at, it's, uh, the way I refer to it in sort of technical terms is um, in, in transportation planning, a lot of times you go through what's called the phase one environmental in the NEPA process. And so the PEL is kind of what I call a phase one light. Um, and so you, it, it allows you to engage um, with the community, the stakeholders, and really identify a lot of the things that would take place in a, an ANIPA phase one, but it allows you to parse out the things that are really non-issues, where you, know, you already have the right of way and the capacity or whatever, you don't have environmental issues. So you can start to focus on designing and executing those. Um, normally, uh, a full PEL takes anywhere from two to three years, the West Connect study which is just finishing, related to 470 in that area, has taken 36 months um, from start to finish. Um, we're releasing a RFP, RFQ, hopefully in the next couple of weeks, which is what is sort of a preliminary step to the PEL, which is to bring, holder, bring together all the stakeholders along the corridor between 470 and 25 um, to agree that we need to do this and really try and wrestle CDOT to a pin to convince them it's really important and to fund it because they have to lead and primarily fund it. So uh, we're in discussions with them about how to execute that uh, going forward.
forward. So um, our hope is to have that preliminary work started um, by um, hopefully the summer. Um, and then uh, it should take probably about six months during that process. Six to eight is my guess. And hopefully by the end of that, we'll have CDOT committed to a more <coughs> Excellent, thank you. I think um, the fact that we've got it started is huge, huge. It's one of those things we talk about, talk about, talk about, um, but it, somebody needs to pull a trigger, so that's been pulled. Um, I would agree with Mark about the importance of this, and I think one of the things that Littleton has to get in front of is developers, because if we do not, if we are not clear about what we want in our community, they will build what they can. And they are completely within their rights to do that. We have some, a, a number of places along Santa Fe that are um, huge and important parts of our community and parts of um, future development and at risk. And I think that the mineral area, this is, I think it's very timely in so much as that is an area that is about ready to undergo change. It will go change. It will undergo change in terms of transportation. It will undergo change in terms of redevelopment and development, um, both at Aspen Grove and at the Answer property. Um, it will undergo change in terms of the light rail because at some point, probably not in any of our lifetimes, unless we um, work on a public-private partnership, the light rail will extend, and that will change what that station looks like and how that station operates. So there's very little in that area that is not destined for substantial change. And um, it is our community, it's our city, it's, it's up to us to make sure that we have a very clear direction for people, uh, developers, etc., as to what we want to see happen there. And this is a great start. And I think the framework, it's kind of, I haven't worked, well, worked with the framework yet in, in the context of um, planning, but I like this. It's kind of like a baby step. It's kind of the light. <laughs> um, first. And I think that taking it to the community at this stage, with, in its current, as long as it's very well explained that this is not final, this is not coming out of the ground tomorrow, um, that I think it will be really interesting to see the response that we get back and the, and the input. And I also think it's an opportunity for us to also test the waters on what we're doing with the Pell and some of the issues that we're dealing with along Santa Fe. And let's face it, Santa Fe is going to be a very different um, transportation link than today, in, in five years than it was today. Stirring Ranch is popping out of the ground and that is going to have a massive massive impact on that on that throughway. Uh, right now it's 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 not a fun street to be on and the safety issues there are becoming larger and larger based on stuff like that. So as it's our responsibility, it's one of our top safety and um, infrastructure. It's our top key core um, responsibility. So that's I think that you know I'd love to hear from others as to if they think this is you know, ready to go to the public? Are we um, looking for anything other than just a blessing on this and we're good? If, are we all going to agree here? I have questions. I have questions. Oh, dear. So, Ask away. Yeah, quick yeah. Uh, uh, Santa Fe, while it's unique in one regard, as it points out, it has the river over here, houses over there, and blah, blah, blah. It's, it's, it's not completely unique. So what other areas in the state have this similar type of an issue, but they don't have the problems that we're having? I mean, we have 50,000 vehicles Monday through Friday on Santa Fe, 25 on the mineral. But what's a, a, another area that is similar? Uh, you know, personally, we haven't really looked into that from the standpoint of the Planning Commission. We've really just been focused on how to create the framework that we want to help with future decision making, but certainly that can be a component that we research and have a conversation around and just maybe learn some best practices maybe from other places that have a similar situation. I, I think it'd be worth you know finding out you know, where is there a problem, I mean, where is there a similar situation that, that doesn't have the same problems that we're having. Another one is on the, the multiple 
the, uh, the multimodal uh, connect uh, mixed use stuff. Uh, I've been dying to say multimodal all day, by the way. <laughs> so, but, uh, That's not good, Jerry. <laughs> but we're looking at putting together autos, bicycles, pedestrians, and, and there's safety concerns there. I mean, it's, it, if you have you know, cars and then bikes, there's, there's a true safety issue for everybody there. And then if you put bikes and people together, there's issues for, again, bicyclists and the pedestrians. So I, 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 well, it's, it's, it's a feel-good thing to me to talk about, oh, yeah, good, let's have this nice walkways and bicycles and autos. And for safety reasons, I, I think we got some real issues there unless we have separate <coughs> something <coughs> fenced-off areas just for bicycle. I know South Suburban is always dealing with it just down there in Mary, uh, the Mary Carter Trail. But uh, if you... Uh, Let's keep that in mind somehow. Also, there was, um, I think it was on page 29, they talked about the different opinions. Tell me a little bit more about that, just a little bit. It was like the third bullet on um, the Chapter 7 area, land use. So, so it was the community input on uh, land use. Yeah, yeah. Well, well, yeah tell me something a little bit more about that. of the community input. Well, I think you're going through the community, but all those points were there. I mean, you have people that said build a five-story building, people that said don't build anything, anything. That's what I want to hear. What I wasn't at the meeting, so I don't no, know. No, but I'm just reading yeah. through all those, uh, those no, points. I want to elaborate were. a little bit. That's what we're looking for. But right, yes. During that entire um, process, which was two meetings and two open houses, we received, a, and then there was a bunch of online engagement as well. So... Um, in November of 2016, we did a compilation of all the feedback we received and presented that to the Planning Commission. So within that, that's this document, um, there were a variety of topics that were brought forward. So on Chapter 7 in that land use, those bullets on that, in the first bullets, it's an overview of what... So generally, traffic and parking, everyone agreed that those were issues. So that was an agreement. Um, everyone also agreed that all the recreational and open space are really um, key community assets that we wanted to enhance to keep in that area. Um, but when it talks about the differences of, that, of opinions right, and the vast... Right, so that's what I'm saying. So outside of those three things, opinions were vast and varied greatly to, to um, Klaus' point of, of input. Some people said we want nothing at all out there. Some people said all we want on the mineral station is a parking structure. Um, it would range from, oh, I'm fine with high story or high rise apartments. I'd like to have more TOD looking transit oriented development on the property. So there were opinions all over the place. So, so from this is nice quiet to park to yes. yeah. huge apartment yeah. buildings, that yeah. kind of stuff. So the grass were all over the place when you look at them. Building heights and residential densities, um, what were appropriate uses, how to manage the pedestrian connections, access to Aspen Grove, the trail, the design, the preservation of the area, maintaining privacy. I mean, there were the comments were wide. And I think you pointed that out is that while you may walk in, a citizen may walk in with a solution, you realize, or they realize that there's. 100 people there, and there's 100 different opinions on what they want things. So it's, this is going to be a tough one. And good reports, by the way. I, I did really appreciate them. And the last one, too, on, in Chapter 7, page 3, where it talks about the uh, value capture uh, scenario. Uh, are, 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 we, are we talking about incentives? Some there? I know in one of the other chapters it talks a little different, not talking incentives, but what is it talking about in this case? Is it talking government incentives? Yeah, you know, it's not intended to be a specific, it's intended to be a broader um, element and really stepping back. So in the market assessment, that's where the um, consultant at the time, they did a, a study about, you know, what's the market-driven likely potential for the future of this area. And then, oh, if you wanted to take a different approach and really focus around, you know, starting with what the community also wants to see and support it that way through um, value capture. So value doesn't have to mean 
money per se, but more what is the community value as well. So there's many levels of the idea behind the value capture, but it's looking at all of those possibilities. It doesn't preclude financial, but it doesn't bind us to that. Jerry, one of the things that was included in that, it was about um, positioning that area. So the value was defined as there's a light rail station, there's a river that runs through it, there's access to the trail, it's a huge transportation corridor. So giving, essentially saying, these are unique assets that you're only finding here and nowhere else potentially in the region. So this has greater value than just this 10-acre plot of land or any other you know, plot of land. So that was what some of that value-driven um, bubbled up from. Thank you. I, said, I think this area of Littleton is so valuable, not from a, a, a monetary aspect, but just in terms of our city and our citizens that we need to have something like this to start the conversation moving forward from this point. Like Mark said, it's just a framework. It's pretty much, seems to me, be the first rung on a ladder that is many rungs high. And I think we need that to start being proactive and not waiting for developers to come and say, hey, we want to do this. And then the community and council is kind of scrambling to say, well, does this fit with what we want? And if we don't have something laid out of a general idea, and this, like you said, there's no standards or well-defined guidelines in here. I think it's probably a good thing for this first step um, when we get to more specific uh, details, specifically with uh, Santa Fe and uh, CDOT, that can drive us. I think the important things in this document are the goals and action steps in each of the chapters. And you see that we have those, those broad goals and then I won't say detailed um, action steps, but things to say, hey, this, these need to drive our future considerations. When we're looking at um, whatever happens in the ENSER project, say, do, do the sidewalks, do the streets fit with this? Are they, do they fit with this plan? And I think as we move forward with a comprehensive plan, that will, that's where more specific standards and guidelines will, will come about as we get more um, tangible interactions with developers and our partners. This is a, uh, uh, use the expression baby step. It is the first baby set, step to eventually a larger uh, uh, transit station study, uh, master study. Uh, but it's a baby step in deciding uh, what, uh, what is the transit oriented development that Littleton wants, not some type of template that's developed by a consultant that we hire. It's a standard that can be done at I-25 or up in Arvada or anywhere else. It's our, what do we want? What kind of density do we want? Uh, so that that's the importance of, of this first baby step. Great. I have a series of comments and maybe some questions. Um, what I really <coughs> like about this is that you brought, you finally have brought in all the various plans that were out there from the South Platte to the Santa Fe, et cetera, and it was actually. Um, well documented and summarized here so that I could read through it and kind of get those salient points. So I really appreciate that. Um, the one thing that I would uh, like you to look at or comment on if you already have, um, as you brought in those plans and you're looking at this framework, was there anything that potentially could be in conflict or the other impression that I got is we're asking for a lot. And can you really do all of that? Is that even possible? You know, we kind of want the kitchen sink and everything else in there. So my, my caution there is um, let's ensure that there isn't conflict because when we put this into practice and are needing to make a decision, we don't want another complementing plan maybe directing one way versus another one another way. So I don't know how we would resolve that conflict. And then, you know, the other question are, are we asking for everything? And I think we have to recognize we probably can't get everything. So just a question that I'm throwing out there. Um, to that, so if you want to come back and answer that, please hold your answer. Um, it would be great to see a almost like a test scenario. Like if we say we're going to use this for decision making, if, if we put out a scenario out there, how can we 
I, I'm still not seeing how I use this to make a decision. Um, so I would love to see that. And, you know, maybe that's something that's just a follow-up. Um, and then the final thing is regarding the community input that you're seeking um, here in a couple of weeks. I think the area, because there's a lot here for a citizen to take in, and I think the areas that we're looking for community input is in the goals and the actions, correct? So that is that where the focus is going to be? Are these the right actions you expect? And then here, um, land use is the one that is the one people are going to have a lot of opinions and we have to try to narrow some of that. But as I look at the land use section, these are words, um, it's planning jargon. And you know, I look at it and say best practices in land use. And sure there's best practices in land use. What are best practices in land use? So, if, if that's where we're asking citizens to comment on, I, I, I don't know that, you know, we, we have presented it in a way that they even, you know, that one can even understand. Sure, that sounds great, but what does that mean? Um, so again, I know the intent was for this to stay high level and vague, but then I struggle with how do we put this into practice, and maybe it's step two, but those are my areas of concern. But we did uh, talk about, uh, we talked about housing, but we didn't say what density. We talked about additional parking, but what does that mean? We didn't say outright, uh, let's build a you know, eight-story parking garage uh, jammed up against the park. We didn't do any of that. We didn't call out the road system, none of that. This is a framework plan, not a, a framework. It's not a master plan. So I think the, the delicate balance is how deep do we go uh, bef uh, before it, it turns into a plan rather than a framework. Um, so a, f a framework we can do in three or four month process. Uh, a master plan, um, fully done, that's a year, low than speed, year and a half to two year process. So. Um, I, ju I just, I, so I understand what you're saying, Mark, you know, but when we talk about you know, <laughs> some things like parking, people understand what parking is. What, land use is just one that is a little bit more broader, um, means a lot of things. Uh, you know, solving for parking, you know, uh, there was one comment that I loved in here where it talked about ensuring that parking is done in collaboration with other partners and that the different property owner, owners are working. So that was very common sense and makes sense and logical um, to anyone that reads it. Again, land use is just a, a little bit of a higher level um, uh, vocabulary um, that if you're, if you're in that world, you get it, you understand mixed use, you, not to minimize you know, our, our citizens and their engagement in this, but I just, I don't know that we're going to get valuable input yeah. in that section. And I think it's an important section to get valuable and well. City manager has something you'd like to add. I'd like to try to answer the question about how this will use, you know, based on my experience uh, in the sequencing of projects that we've got. I believe how this will play out is the planning commission and the city council will adopt this framework or master plan. Quite honestly, I don't know if it'll matter here. Hear the rest of what I have to say, but if you adopt that, <coughs> then the next step will be. Two projects running in parallel. One will be the PEL, and then the next one is going to be, depending on council direction of the retreat, is going to be the vision to comp plan process. And so as CDOT moves through the PEL, you're going to be asking them to evaluate this, that entire corridor with this in mind. So you're going to be specifically asking the consultant CDOT to evaluate the project in relation to this adopted master plan. So you'll see specific policy decisions that will have to come out of the PEL, and eventually the council will have to adopt that PEL. So you'll see there'll be an opportunity between the PEL and this adopted plan. If you adopt the PEL, you're going to be superseding, quite honestly, uh, to uh, some extent, this framework. Then, in sequencing and timing, you're going to have the vision to comp plan. So the comp plan then is going to take not only this adopted plan, but it's also going to take the PEL into consideration. And then once again, the council is going to eventually have to reconcile those 
those policy decisions and formally adopt the comp plan with an element of a transportation master plan. It's that element of the transportation master plan that incorporates this and the PEL. So over time, you're going to be superseding this, is my guess, as you move through those two separate processes. Yeah, I think Bruce. Just... I was going to more or less make an observation pretty similar. I mean, Mark's is way more comprehensive but essentially land use is sort of the last one in here because I think collectively we <coughs> there are land use decisions that need to be made in this set of parcels uh, but until we understand what's going on with the PEL uh, until we understand what's going on with ENSER Mark you know mentioned both ENSER and I guess the PEL are supposed to are essentially you know the, the, the gorillas in the room anyway that, that really Acknowledging land use as a component of this is important for where we are in the framework. But there wasn't a lot we could do in terms of saying specifically other than you got, as Mark said, all this input from the community that had been gathered over various other projects that should be part of the discussion. We couldn't go a lot deeper with this because these several other really large attributes of any project are sort of pending and until we know what's going on with them, we can't reconcile it yet. I was going to say, yeah, it sounds like this is not necessarily the decision-making document. You know, you're not going to refer to this, this is what we do per this document. But this drives the conversation forward with CDOT and to say, hey, you know, we're going to be building off of this into the future, and that's where the more detailed, uh, more direct, more direction will uh, come from. Carol, back to where I think Jerry was. Oh, yeah, he's right there. Um, there, um, it, it, I will expand on that. Um, it seems like there is inherent conflict between the uh, TOD element that keeps appearing transit-oriented development, and it seems to me that development is the heavy word in that, uh, meaning, I think, by definition, high density. And then what we heard from the citizens, that they were concerned about the consequences of a little bit of density, meaning traffic, not necessarily high density, traffic and parking, and the concern about nature and the river. And then we're trying to put both of them into one plan right up against each other. And it's kind of looking to me like river, high density. And we think those are somehow going to mesh together into Littleton small town charm. Uh, can we modify, uh, tweak transit-oriented development so that it has a Littleton flavor and isn't necessarily multi-story packed in tight up against our river. Is that we can define what our transit oriented development we, is. Yeah, we it don't, doesn't have as to I be. said before, we don't have to, Did you to say stand that already? by the template. Yes. We don't have to stand by the template. We can we can oh, say what we would means. like. Okay. Nothing wrong with that. Uh, uh, we will do so. Could could we have from you folks uh, an idea of what that might be? Uh, yes, we've got a lot of citizen input, uh, what, 108 pages of comments oh, that uh, sure, give us direction. But I mean from the planning commission. Uh, eventually, yes. The reason why this project uh, got put on hold after 2016 was there obviously was not enough information. There was a great unknown of what's going on with the Santa Fe corridor. Uh, is there going to be a overpass uh, uh, at uh, Mineral? Is, is Santa Fe going to be turned into a you know ten lane expressway right through the western part of our city, right next to? Dan I don't know. Uh, what are they going to come up with at the, during the Pell study? Sure, th those put are us on hold. Uh, so uh, once we get more information, then we can continue uh, and complete the, the master plan study of that station and the surrounding area get involved with uh, uh, continuing on with the comprehensive plan, which includes a, a quarter, a re, a re I, I would the like to study. continue. Uh, thank you. Um, that uh, be, maybe before this is presented to, taken to the citizens, February 15th or so, is that, is that right? Is that, is, do I understand that that's the process? 
Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Assuming outcome from tonight. Sure, 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 sure. But as a, a possible next step that, um, that might help the citizens digest this if, if there, there was some idea given to them about what transit-oriented development, Littleton-style, might be. Because we know they went through that last iteration with the buttons where they got to choose between various styles our standards, not by Hong Kong's standards, but by Littleton's standards. <laughs> and, and so to give them some flavor, like I don't know what that might be, a Littleton flavored transit oriented development, but I, I would be truly excited to find out what that might be, even even though we don't know what the intersection is going to ultimately be. got some pretty clear hints uh, 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 intermixed with uh, all over the place uh, with, with the community comment. For me, I, I gather three things. Uh, um, you know, the, there was the uh, Republican uh, statement, you know, it's economy stupid. Well, if I look at the, all the citizens' input, it's the parking stupid, the traffic stupid, and the park stupid. <laughs> Those are the three three items that, that everybody zeroes in on. You take the stupid out of that, the same thing Jocelyn said. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> She's more eloquent. <laughs> Which I think this is... You almost described this document that this is the start of that defining what this transit-oriented development is in Littleton. Yeah. I mean, that's But, but it hasn't is. done it yet. No, not not clearly enough for me as a citizen. Yeah, I don't think it is the, you know, end-all, be-all of that. No. And so, yeah. I, I'm just suggesting that the citizens probably could use some help in assurance of what that might be to, to translate between really big and really flat. That was my point on land use, because that's where oh, it would come okay. out, is on the land use. And it's there, it's not at that level of detail. So I don't know that we would, I don't know that we would get that if feedback, or maybe it depends on how you would be present or looking for this community input to, to happen. It, you know, to use an example, it says, action step A, future decision making needs to ensure best practices and land use are considered when development and redevelopment. Yes, absolutely. But it doesn't tell me what that is. As a citizen, I right. would have, well, even as a council member, I don't know what that means. Right. I'm true so it's, I'm, I'm just, um, <laughs> as you um, lay this out, I'm, I, don't, I don't know how you are going to get, what kind of community input you're going to get. I'm a citizen. Are you looking to get a yes or no on each of these action steps? Or are you looking for, tell me what best practices and land use are? Maybe, maybe that'll help give us the clarity of what that community meeting would be. So there was a toss-up question in the beginning of uh, what do you want from council? Uh, I, if I could speak for Jocelyn and you, oh, no. Bob, and the rest of the commission, I'd say uh, what I'd like to see from the council is uh, your comments on this. Uh, this isn't done. This is a draft. Um, comments on uh, page by page, mm -hmm. we can uh, take take it up again. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I got them all in <laughs> Meeting adjourned. Okay. Go on up and Robin and then Peggy. It's just kind of tailgating a little bit on what Carol and um, Prina and, and Mark were saying, but it, and we see this throughout, and, and I think also what Mark was saying, we're talking about, when we talk about a river, we don't really have a lot of direction. So here we're talking maybe about Mineral Station, but I'm thinking um, even beyond that at some point, obviously not on this framework, but you know, when we look through any of the plans we have, it tells us about a river. We want to protect it, enhance it, preserve it, buffer it, have a proper balance, celebrate it, experience it, respect it, be compatible, improve it, right? What does that mean? Because, you know, to me, as a planning commissioner, I have no idea where I need to take that direction. Um, so maybe in the process, coming from not in this framework, obviously, but as we're working towards a comprehensive plan and our vision, what is our vision for the river? What do those words actually mean to us as a community? You know, we have a downtown standards and guidelines that's 362 pages, and it describes what we want in our downtown. Um, I think this kind of shows us that we need to do the same thing for a river, not just Santa Fe, but the river going up and down through the city, since it's such a huge, important item to us. Um, we actually do have something close to that, which is the charrette that the South Platte Working Group did 
um, which designates the uses and stuff along the river. So that that could be a good start, Peggy. Yeah, I'm not sure what my brain's going to try to say here. <laughs> I, I would point out that um, this is minor first, just minor, but in the stationary the station area framework in the last page, there are two step B's. I assume one should be a C rather than a letter B. But when I was looking at that, that's what I, I mean, just looking at it for another reason, I noticed the two action steps. But one of them is talking about maintaining the views to the river port, park, and mountain vistas to the west. And so my my, what came to my mind is views for whom, from where? From here? Well, we can't see it from here. From the top of Jackass Hill? Well, they could see it. From the bottom of Jackass Hill? They can't see it. But across the other side of Santa Fe? I mean, where are we talking about maintaining views? And, I mean, I, kn I know that probably sounds stupid, but it is an important thing to grasp. I like... I like our trying to do this, to see what we can do, but are we also, are we talking about people who are there going up to Denver, coming here, going over to the Littleton Hospital and the medical center associated with that? Where, who's going where, from where, with what intent? Because part of it makes it sound like Everybody's going to go work downtown Denver, and that isn't going to happen. And some of those people will retire, and I assume they'll want to stay there um, until somebody runs over them because they want to buy their house. Um, I'm teasing, but, but you know, people are living longer, and when the families come to visit, because it talked in this one thing I'm looking at about the average size houses and the number of my children and whatever because people are older, but people come to visit. So needing more than two bedrooms is quite likely if you had, because some people use a bedroom for a study and another bedroom to actually sleep in, but then when visitors come, so I'm not sure that the market is necessarily going to be what this says it's going to be. All that jumble, just to say that. Um, anyway, here. I think Peggy, uh, Peggy brought it up a very important thing, kind of in passing. A Littleton Hospital and that whole area, medical development, that might be a destination and transit oriented development. I'm not sure how far that definition goes. But it, it, once you get to, on light rail, to Littleton Mineral Station, then what can you do? Right now, you can't do much. That's going to change very rapidly. Uh, Enzer and the light rail station are joined at the hip. Um, uh, I mean, about like getting to Littleton Hospital. Well, you, you talk about that, that being a nodal point, and then you talk about what, what's going on at Santa Fe and I, I, I'm just thinking of, of, I'm not thinking about Enzer type things, but just how do, if this, if, if transit is an important part of transit oriented development, if it goes beyond development, then we probably need to consider how do you get from Littleton Station, like Peggy was saying, to somewhere else? Because right now you can get to Littleton Station. And so, Carol, the first conclusion, because I, I know I, I thought that through, and there's actually a section here that talks <coughs> about um, not just the light rail and what happens at the mineral station, but that there's also bus transit mm -hmm. there. Mm -hmm. If we come to the conclusion that this is a transportation hub, let's, let's exactly. give it that, that title, it, yes. then that changes the conversation. If a transportation it's a hub, hub it's different behaves, than it's a looks different than um, you know, an off, you know, an economic development driver from an offices and uh, a center of commercial, etc. So, um, I think everyone is looking for detail that, of course, we're not we're not landing on, and there's other processes that need to happen to get us there. I come back to I think this is this is a great document. 
My only concern is, one of the asks that you had of us is, um, are we ready to bring it to the community? And I right now don't know what you're asking of the community or what type, what you're going to get back that you can use. Um, so that's my only hesitation at this point. But I, I like where we're going with this. How do you guys feel about that, Dave? Sad. It's not ready for prime time. What do we need to do to get it there? What well, well, that's, I think that's your opinion. I think it's ready to present to the community. But again, to their point, what is the hope of that meeting? Is that more just a communication meeting, or is that to allow people to express their concerns, or what's the hope of that meeting? Uh, yes. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's a, a typical meeting, uh, a community meeting. Uh, you know, we, we have to do the legwork so that the community has something to react against rather than everybody just waving their hands with nothing in front of them. They have something in front of them. Uh, they can argue or, or, or discuss or suggest uh, getting tighter, getting looser. Uh, this word is wrong. Uh, you know, a B should be a C, whatever. Uh, there's a run-on sentence here and there, whatever. Um, so that has value, and then we'll go back and uh, probably spend one more study session uh, uh, reviewing that input, uh, compare it to the input that we've got in 2016, plus all the information that we've got, and bingo, now we're ready to have a formal meeting in that room and vote on it. I mean, if this is the, the, if this is the top of the pyramid, and it's, I mean, essentially what you're going to probably ask people to do is, here's the framework. Step back. You guys, a couple, I think in December, basically had the study session that said, you know, we've got to do the PEL. We've, we've got to craft a framework that we can use to guide what's going on. So the ask is basically, what, what's missing from the framework that's guiding our discussions as we go forward? Uh, help us understand what else TODs obviously want. Uh, are there others that we need to incorporate in a 20,000 foot framework, we're not at 10,000 feet yet, we're, we're still up here. We'll get there. Uh, but we need a lot more information. We need the PEL. We need some of these other studies. We, don't, we need to see what's going on with ENSER. So it fleshes out over time. But as a, as a guidepost or a milestone step in this, this is sort of where we are today. Tell us what you think of what we've got here, and then we'll incorporate it. Next time we come back to you, it'll be more. Hi. Yeah, I mean, this seems like a response to the community input saying, hey, this is what we heard. Yeah. Are we hearing you right? It's basically, is there anything to see? Sure. That's yeah. so we can move forward and, you know, to get back to the details into the future. You don't want to jump into the details without a response to say, you know, be proactive. We heard you. This is what we heard. This is what the key points were taken away is. And then we can get to the details with the, you know, how is that acting as a hub? And, you know, I did have the same thought with uh, Carol did about how to get to hospital. Got Google? Just take the 401 right over there. Put you there 22 minutes later. So, I mean, it's... <laughs> We've come a long way since uh, uh, we had two Urban Land Institute studies, which talked about El Humongo Grande over there, okay? They were in the weeds. Uh, and uh, come a long way, and you compare that to uh, the community meeting and input we've got there. It's, uh, it's far, far apart. Um, so I, I think we're starting to hear uh, Littleton's uh, answer, Littleton's answer to Urban Land Institute studies. And we need to also consider that, you know, like Peggy said, this isn't just people either coming to the station, to this area, or the people that live in this area. And that's one thing that kind of struck me looking at the community input, which I think is important. It drives that those people that live around there in that half mile radius are going to be impacted the most, but they're not the only ones using it. And I did notice that if you look at the demographics between Littleton, the surrounding area, and the people at the, um, the people that responded, it was, there was conflict there of who actually responded and who actually lives in Littleton. Because there was age, income, um, and it, it was not Littleton that responded as, as a whole. Point. I've heard a couple things. One is that Mark, you've asked us to, um, mark this document up with our thoughts and return it to you. Keeping in mind that it's a framework, not a master plan. Yes, <laughs> That's right. Please, 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 Karina. <laughs> I only have two 
Sandy just. <laughs> I do. Um, I would. I think one of the the way the best ways to consider taking this back to the public is to. One of the reasons why there's over a hundred responses is some from the community, and it's kind of all over the place, which is always a good place to start, but not going back there. So it, we have to tighten it up mm -hmm. because what will start to happen is you keep asking me, I keep telling you, you keep ignoring me. Um, so I think it needs to be tightened up. I think there needs to be um, maybe look at it in terms of choices and scenarios as opposed to just open-ended. Um, I don't know how that works, but I think that will get us better answers. It will make help us to get to a place in a more clear fashion. Um, and I think that, I think it is ready for the public in terms of um, can we can mark this thing framework. Yeah. We can mark this thing up for a year. Well, and I agree with Mark in the beginning. You know, the public gave their their input over a year ago, and we need to be a lot more responsive on that. And dragging these things out has abs done us absolutely no good. So I think that moving this trajectory, you guys are doing Yeoman's work on this, and you'll be doing more. Um, council, can we reasonably, each of us individually, get comments back to the planning? When's your next meeting? When's your next meeting? Um, February. Second week. Have a formal meeting coming in? Or study session? The 12th. It's February 12th. What is it? Is it to you by the 12th, by February 12th, or do you want them sooner? Sooner. Sooner. <laughs> when do you want them? One week. One week. Yeah. Well, let, me, let me just, I just want to say, you know, my comments are, I actually think the document is, you know, in and of itself is ready for public. What I don't feel is ready is how you're conducting that input. So my comments are actually, are not about um, the structure or things that I would change. It's more of some of the things that were outlined there that I think are very important and, um, you know, let's make sure we this is an element we take forward in the next step. So my comments are not, um, just if everybody's waiting for my comments, it's not going to change your document. It is more... It's for the future. Right. It's more of these are um, specific elements that I think are very strong, that make sense, that we should move forward with, or is, these are some that I are, for, for me, as almost more like a citizen, would be um, so my comments should not be holding up me feeling that this is ready. What I feel is I, I have not gotten a good understanding of what community input looks like mm -hmm. and what that is going to look like. What will it look like online? Will, what will it look like in a meeting? Are you going to set up different, different stations so people can comment on transportation? So I don't know that we're making best use of our citizens' time, and to Debbie's point, I don't want to frustrate them again, to have them come to another meeting, to ask me the same question that I told you before, that's where I'm uncomfortable. I think this is a great document. Put it in writing. Okay. This, this is not a Q&A session. This is a present. You're going to be presenting. Is that... We haven't really talked about it yet. How oh, it's going to be that's that important. Important. The format yeah. of that meeting. Oh, yeah. And, 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 and how about. we solicit the feedback and how we present it. Gotcha. We've I heard agree, open it's house, not, we've heard Q&A. Right, heard. but it's not to go back and start the bar bigger conversation. Right. It's taking this, because we started with a no, bigger conversation, now we're here, so it's talking about it here in that context. Right, the point is not because otherwise it will be more... Yeah. So is it fair to then just ask for you guys to come back to us with a proposal of what your community meeting or input format is going to be? Is that? I would rather not. If you, if you feel I, comfortable giving us direction, then we can take that. And well, I would, I would suggest that council do their markup document. If, if you have anything that you want to, you need edits or whatever that you want to make, and get that to Jocelyn mm -hmm. by the 30th. And then as you guys refine what this looks like, um, Jocelyn, perhaps you can share that back with us at a meeting. And, and that way we'll have an idea of what you guys are looking at. I don't 
I am not comfortable stepping in and, and telling you what to do or designing it for you, but I'd like to know kind of where you're, what you're looking at, just for my, for our own knowledge and, and um, how we can help you. So, always, please. Oh, it would be most appreciated. So we are here for you. The executive summary is not complete yet. Perhaps that might be a way to have a forward-looking kind of community um, summary in the document to help explain the community, the intent, and hopefully guide some of their comments. So that might be a real important part of the document that's missing. Okay, um, trying to keep on our time. If there isn't anything else. I do have a question. Okay. I'm not remembering seeing something about height limits. It's not quite Central Park. So, <laughs> so I'm going to suggest something, and then you all can go ballistic. I'd like to have a height limit of three stories. It probably will not appear in this document uh, that's down the road. Okay. Well, I mean... You planted so, the seed. So, to say, to then say down the road to establish height limit for the... For the and you would, that would be well, predicated on the zoning. Though. Yeah, exactly. Yes. We've got, we got the use by right to zoning. Uh, or whatever it's zoned up for. Framework. Framework. Uh, future. Uh, okay. okay. Determine right. world where we do whatever. Well, I was trying to think of all the different zoning that's out there right now, whether that would take away somebody's... It would? Okay. But potentially we could suggest that what is exists not be changed, or we would just wait until somebody wants to bring a project and have a public hearing. <laughs> you just jumped ahead of your half. <laughs> Yeah. Yep. Okay. Uh, we do have some guests that are here to present the next presentation. So if everybody feels good about where we are. Yep. Great. Thank you, Planning Commission. Good job. Thank, Thank you. you for job. coming tonight. Thank you for all you're doing. And so, all we're you're on for, doing. so we're on for the 15th. We don't have to vote on that or anything. We just said, let's We don't do anything. Other than give them all the yeah. comments. Yeah. Yep. By next Tuesday. Yeah. We don't have a meeting, so. Thank you. Okay, we'll take, uh, we'll reconvene at 7.45. Gives everybody a chance. Yeah, thank you.
biogas to renewable natural gas financing update. We have our, uh, Mark is going to start this off. So thank I will Mayor. hand it to Mark. All right. Thank you, Mayor. So um, I know we had, as part of the council orientation, an opportunity to bring the new council down to the wastewater treatment plant. So you got a quick tour, and uh, in just a second, I'm going to hand it over to John Kuzman, the director of the plant here. And uh, just <coughs> quickly, there had been um, approval here by both city councils to put into the budget for the plant the in preliminary engineering work here for this biogas concept. And I know in the tour we had a, had a very brief conversation, but for the existing council we had a pretty uh, robust conversation this past year. So now we're at a decision point, and I think I'm going to turn it over to John Kuzma. It's going to put a little context behind that and be a little more specific about what we require here tonight. So welcome, John. Thank you. Sure. Well, so tonight we're actually here to present information. Uh, it, it's, it really is. Uh, we've received direction. We're... Uh, the day-to-day -day operations of this facility are under a supervisory committee, both the city managers from each city, public works directors. We presented to them last week uh, uh, basically a follow-up uh, to, to this project recommending a financing approach. The, the supervisory committee has endorsed that approach, uh, and we're here presenting that information. And as that always, uh, typically, uh, the city managers on big issues like this that really sort of shape the strategic direction of the wastewater enterprise, uh, a lot of times they'll bring that to councils to solicit any feedback relative to that recommendation. But uh, we're here for information, to share that information. We're also here to share information on, uh, we're rebranding our organization. That, and you heard a little bit about where we're trying to fit actually in the region. Uh, and that's also, we, we'd like uh, to share that information, share our direction, and if there's any feedback you want to give Mark uh, and Keith, then they can take that forward. So before I get going on these two information topics, I'd like to take just a quick step back uh, and start with that term wastewater and really define <coughs> what that means, or what the business of wastewater is. And I'd like to maybe propose a different adjective in, instead of waste, uh, and you'll hear that different adjective later going on. But we're really in the water business, okay? There's drinking water. Uh, it's water that supports our bodies, cleanses our bodies, and, and supports our very livelihood. There's waters that is stored in lakes and rivers uh, that provides resiliency uh, in drought conditions, so, you know, very similar to <laughs> This winter that we're in right now, resiliency for climate change. Uh, it provides habitat uh, for recreation, for aquatic life, uh, uh, for some, uh, and for recreation. So water means that. Water means food supply, and it means the agricultural economy for seven of the top uh, producing agricultural communities in the state of Colorado. They're downstream of the South Platte River. So. And then in terms of our business, water is used to convey waste from industries, from people's homes. It's this magical element that takes everybody's waste, moves it away from where they want it, and brings it to us for ultimately treatment. And so this, we want, now want to map that in the context of we sit in the arid west. We are essentially a desert climate here. We're, we're not near the coast where there's this abundant supply of seawater that we can tap into. And our community is growing at, at, at record pace here. And so the demand on these precious, precious resource, this finite resource, for all those different uses that we described makes water very, very valuable going forward. It's, it's more than just the, the conduit for conveying waste to us. It needs to be reclaimed to serve our society's growth going forward. And so when that water gets conveyed to us, I'd like to talk a little bit about sort of an input-output model of what we do with that, what our business is. So we take that, that, that mismatch of, of waste product and we apply human ingenuity to it, equipment, energy, and chemicals. And what we produce is water that's been renewed for new purposes. We produce an energy-rich soil amendment, and we produce clean air. Okay, and th those are important is that costs money. And for all the ratepayers that we're here representing tonight, 
uh, we need to be very fiscally responsible as we're converting uh, that, that water into these products on, on, on the back end. And so we need to be coming to you with very innovative projects that show a community benefit, but do it in a fiscally responsible manner. Uh, and we need to be very strategic about how we're communi communicating that community benefit to those stakeholders going forward. And so the two information items fit in that category there. It's a very innovative project, and then the branding that we're going to talk about a little bit later helps us to communicate where we fit in the overall ecosystem going forward. So the project we're here to talk about tonight is this biogas conversion to renewable natural gas. And this is this is one of those, as, as an engineer, this is one of those dream projects that you dream about. And so it allows us to improve one of those three outputs we talked about. This really allows us uh, to improve air quality in our community and harvest the energy associated with one of our emissions in a really novel way. And it allows us to generate revenue. Uh, that presents the opportunity to generate revenue uh, as a result of that conversion. So much so that you're seeing other communities on the front range looking to do these same type of projects. Uh, City of Grand Junction did a project like this, uh, I believe, five to ten years ago and has been reaping the benefits of that, that investment for a long time. You're hearing about the cities of Longmont, cities of Boulder, city of Colorado Springs, exploring similar projects. There's a strong community push for this, and there's federal incentives that are in place that make this project very viable going forward, and we're here to share uh, our, our approach for that. I want to share, we presented this last night to the city of Inglewood and got their feedback, uh, basically also an information session, but they did have some comments that we'll incorporate going forward. Okay, this, uh, I, I want to kind of characterize where we're at in the project life cycle. We've been talking to past councils uh, about this uh, for, for well over a year. Uh, and last year there were two really critical decisions that really set the direction of this project going forward. One in the third quarter of um, last, uh, last year, uh, councils approved the design services contract, which allowed us to basically formalize the design uh, of a uh, biogas cleaning skid and also a pipeline to connect it into Excel Energy. So that the engineering portion of that is, is, has been funded by, uh, both, uh, both, by both councils. The other part of that is on the Inglewood side, who's the administrator for the wastewater en enterprise, they approved the $8 million allocation uh, in the 2018 budget for this biogas project. So they basically allocated uh, reserves in order to fund this project uh, from a cash basis in 2018. So we're here not asking for approvals, but we're asking for confirmation on the recommended, or confirmation of the recommended financing approach. And the reason that's important is because this financing approach, it really, it it determines how we ultimately de deliver this project uh, um, going forward. So the three financing approaches that we shared with supervisory committee were one with the one that's already been recommended with the cities co-financing this uh, through cash reserves. The second is we did a pretty exhaustive evaluation of other uh, financing instruments from bonds uh, to municipal lease to state-issued uh, state financing. Uh, and the one that was most favorable in that analysis was the municipal lease. And so when I present these later on, uh, you, can, you, we can, you can understand that that, that, that was the one that was uh, the preferred option of those other instruments. The reason it was preferred is it allowed us to customize the term of the repayment, and we basically chose a three-year repayment to fit within uh, the, the, the basically the existing framework for federal credits. It allowed us to pay the project back in terms with the existing framework of federal credits. Uh, it allowed us to uh, have the instrument in place to help mitig mitigate risk and, uh, and that instrument is termination without penalty. Basically the leasing agent would, would come in, recover the assets if the city chose to uh, not appropriate in that in, in any given year for paying back the municipal lease payments. And we'll, we'll talk a little bit more of that going forward. 
The third option that we looked at is a public-private partnership or a P3 agreement. And really the advantage to this is would be a third-party private financer would come in uh, and for, um, for a sharing in the ultimate revenue stake here, they would, they would come up and uh, share their experience for delivering these types of projects, but also come up with private financing uh, to eliminate some of that initial financing risk. And so to better characterize what this P3 arrangement would look like, we went out to market. And we went out to market with a request for information, uh, trying to assess project and market risk, trying to assess what the market was looking for in some of these partnerships. Uh, and then what they saw for terms of financing. And I'm really pleased to see there, say that at, there was a lot of interest in this type of, 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 of the renewable natural gas project. We got five proposals back uh, from uh, Big Ox was one, Amoresco, True Star, uh, New Phase Energy, and renewable natural gas. These are these are very established brands in the renewable natural gas industry, and they were very interested in the project. And so, very briefly, I'd like to summarize. We took all five of these proprietary proposals and synthesized the information down into uh, this is the feedback we heard. So, as far as market risk, and this ties to the viability of a rene renewable natural gas market and the viability of these RIN credits, which help influence the financing and the revenue streams associated with this. All five of the respondents said very strongly they believe very firmly in the renewable natural gas market and that will be sustained into the future. And the, uh, and the promise of the RIN market is, 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 is one of the factors that makes this project very attractive to them. What does RIN stand for? Uh, identification number, and so that's the, uh, it, it's, a, it's a form of credit uh, that uh, basically energy producers get from the federal government when they put this in their portfolio. So it's a, it's a form of transfer, and it's, it's not a very elegant name, it's identification number, but, but it's essentially a documentation of a credit. I'll, I'll add on to that if I may. Sure. Because I didn't know either, so I did some research on it. And it's it's a credit for uh, biogas if if the biogas is actually used in some other, uh, in, in somewhere. And so if the biogas goes to market and if it is sellable, um, if it has enough BTUs in, which often biogas doesn't, um, and if there is a market for it, then uh, it gets sold, then we get eventually credit for that. But if uh, there is no market for our biogas, say in five years when it um, becomes profitable, I think it was four years out that it would take to break even on our $8 million investment between the two cities, if there's no market at that time, then, um, for example, if the government is no longer pushing for um, petroleum producers to include an ethanol-type product in their mix for energy efficiency, if that goes away, all kinds of things could cause that to go away. Or if the whole RIN thing goes away, which it is scheduled right now in the legislation to go away uh, in, 20, in the year 2020, that's the same time that our profitability starts. If it's not renewed then, if the government environment isn't there to renew RINs, um, then we have nothing to take to market. We cannot get money for this biogas if there is not a market for RINs. So that's a huge risk. Just one point of clarification. The RINs are uh, written into legislation through the year 2022. Uh, uh, and, uh, yes, uh, 2022. Yep, four, four years. And that's when the $8 million and I, and I'd li I have some, I'd like to share, uh, continue to share the slides. I think it addresses some of some I just want to get a, since Karina asked, I wanted to get a. Oh, yeah, thank, uh, thank, yeah, you, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, 
like I say, the, the market believes that both the RIN market is viable and then the renewable natural gas market, which extends beyond just the RIN. Uh, there's compressed natural gas. There are other outlets for biogas going forward. The respondents are looking for at a minimum of a 10-year agreement, and the majority of the respondents we got back were on the 20-year agreement. So they're the private industry who does this for a living they're looking at this as a viable project beyond the terminology, uh, the terms of the RINs. Uh, and so that's one of the things we really, one of the valuable things we got out of this uh, request for information from the market. The other thing is, um, talk about project risk, is sometimes when uh, it, biogas, it sounds very uh, uh, intimidating, right? And the conversion of biogas to renewable natural gas, that sounds really intimidating from a technology standpoint. Uh, what we heard from the market is this is very well established technology. These are things like carbon filters and iron iron filters and there's compression. This is, this is technology that's been very well established in the petroleum industry, in various, uh, uh, various industries outside of this. And so there's a lot of, there's not technological risk here. There's not implementation. Uh, and the, and the O&M risk associated with this can be managed through experience and good specifications. And then finally, the long-term operation risk. You know, we have a, our core business is to treat water, right? And biogas is one of the out, outputs that we, so if our process changes because of regulations or different technologies, we want to make sure that we have flexibility that the biogas operations changes. And so what we heard from the market, and one of the reasons we went to the RFI is what length of term are they looking for? And they say only one respondent uh, said that they would, they would entertain a 10-year, uh, and then all of the uh, financial proposals that we saw actually were for a 20-year period. And so that's this is sort of a mixed bag. For, I'm going to editorialize here. This is great in that they see this as a viable long-term market. They see the RNG as a really strong market tender. But from a flexibility standpoint, them wanting that longer-term agreement sort of limits our nimbility and our ability to be flexible as the market changes and as our operations changes going forward. We, we have a pretty good feel with what the market's looking for. John, what you're really just saying is, I mean, obviously we would go, you know, my mind, a 10-year was better than a 20-year because then, then we basically they their their uh, uh, their commitment is paid off uh, through the natural gas. And, you know, 20 years seems awfully long to me, but yes, you know, am I on the right track? Yeah, we yeah. we we asked the question uh, seven, 10, 15. And we wanted to see sure. what their where their interest lied, and it lo it it lay on the longer term scale. Sure. Well, Our interest lies on sure. the shorter scale, trying to get this paid off sooner so that we can incorporate it into our asset base and manage it in the terms of the rest of our asset base. Yeah. So what we did is we took this bigger, all of that background information I just gave you, we took it and tried to synthesize it into one graphic here that highlights sort of the risk-reward balance of financing. Okay. For a baseline assumption, this is what was in the Inglewood 2018 budget, which was cash financing the project. It requires about an $8 million initial outlay, and that would be $4 million from each city. That money is available within both cities' sewer fund reserves, okay? Inglewood has about $6 million, uh, and Milton, a 20? About 20. About $25 million. So there are cash reserves available. And again, that's the base assumption. So you're, you're, you're financing the outlay up front. And then the revenue is coming in from the renewable natural gas market over the 10-year period and generating approximately 12 million. We're estimating about $12 million of revenue at the end of, the 10, at the end of a 10-year period. Okay, so that's the blue line right here. The next was that uh, municipal lease, okay? The leasee is providing the upfront capital, and so there's no capital outlay, but we're paying back that lease in that three-year term, and that's what, that's what you're seeing is these, these are annual lease payments, uh, and then once that's paid back, the revenues start to kick in, and, and, and they're at the same 
we own all of, we would own all those same revenue rights. So the slope is the same, but the difference is the cost of capital for the municipal lease. And that's about a million dollar difference at the end of the 10 year period is there. And then finally, this is the P3, the public private partnership here, where again, they're fronting the capital risk, but they're wanting, they're, because they're fronting that capital risk, they're wanting a big chunk of those profits. And the profits, they're mostly on average is about a 50-50 split. And there was also some capital repayment costs in there that drive the slope of this line. And what you see there is about a $9 million difference at the end of the 10-year period for them providing that capital risk uh, and the overall risk of the project. That's a pretty substantial uh, uh, cost for that. Are those numbers annual or cumulative? So it wouldn't be... This is cumulative. This is over the 10-year period, yeah. Okay. And so when you synthesize this all together, and after we've talked to the uh, to both the city finance de departments and the supervisory committee, this is the recommendation we're asking you to confirm today. Um, we believe cash financing still provides the best risk value for both cities moving forward. One of the reasons is capital risk is not a major factor. Both cities have re reserve balances that can fund this project. Third party financing does mitigate the RIN risk. It, it is the one financial model that does provide the most mitigation for RIN risk, but it comes at a very significant cost. About 75% of the forecasted revenue over this 10 year period would, be, would, would go to mitigating that risk. What we heard from the third party market is this is a very viable business to get into. And the biggest way for us to mitigate RIN risk is to get to market quickly, to get this project built and constructed and have that revenue coming back before the, the, uh, the fixed term of the RINs expires or, or is, is programmed to expire in 2022. There's a lot of speculation out there uh, that that RIN market will still continue after 2022, but right now it's written into legislation through 2022. And so our best RIN mitigation method is to get this built as soon as possible so that the revenue is coming in before those RINs expire in 2022. Okay. The third financing option that we looked at was this municipal lease. It does provide risk mitigation at a pretty low cost. It was about a million dollars over the 10 year period. But what we heard when we talked to the cities and we talked to specifically Inglewoods, a financial advisor, none of them recommended that we would ever invoke the default clause of this municipal, municipal lease payments. Even though it would be tied to the sewer funds and in theory it would be that that default risk would be isolated to the, the sewer funds. All of our investors said that there, it, would, it had the potential of a negative reputational risk on the city's sewer funds, and it may impact the overall bond rating of each city as well. So even though there, it appears there's an instrument of risk mitigation, uh, what we heard from each city is they would not likely ever come to you with a re recommendation to default on those payments. And so in a lot of ways, it's an illusion of, of risk mitigation. So again, cash finding, financing is our recommended approach. Uh, it, it gets us to the market fastest. It has the highest revenue generation for the cities. We hear that the RIN market is highly endorsed and the renewable natural gas uh, market, natural gas from an from a international, national, state level, that market is continuing to grow, and the renewable portion of that is, a, is, is that commodity is trying to grow in those portfolios, and each of the cities has the capital reserves uh, available. I have a question for you, John. Sure. You said Inglewood has about 9 mil, and we have about 20? Inglewood has about 6. I'm sorry six if I missed 25. Why the big gap? What's happened over the years? Well, each city has a responsibility to fund their enterprises independently, and so it's just a matter of different asset base conditions, different assumptions going forward. So I can't really comment, but it, it's, I can tell you it's not really surprising that the cities have different reserve balances because they have different, they probably have different 
philosophies for funding and managing their assets. I would add um, part of that too is that we've had some fairly large uh, districts come online with the city of Littleton and so we're providing sewer service to Roxborough now and when they come online they have to pay a tap fee and so there are a couple of years where we have some pretty significant tap fees that have come in related to those districts. Now the, the counter to that is that we will be billing them annually for the sewer service and um, it's intended that those tap fees are used to pay for uh, the plant, the treatment side of it. Right, and then on the Inkwood side, they haven't had those tap fees for the most part. I can't speak to that. I just, I, I, I don't know if they've had any new districts come online on their side. I just know that we've had a couple on our side that have uh, definitely bumped up. Okay. Our At least we know, yeah, we know that. I think they do have tap fees, but the fee that they charge may be different based on their community values and based on uh, their their desire to attract businesses and, and things like that. And so it's not uncommon for different municipalities to have different financing approaches for a shared asset like this. So for Inglewood, though, the, the risk is, is higher yeah. in, in failure. I mean, for us, it's only like a third of our capital. For them, it's like almost 80%. What happens if their capital reserves get dangerously low? How does it affect us? What, what, what Englewood's advised us is that they would this uh, the funding of the four million dollars their portion of it would not get them below their minimum uh, reserve requirement, and they've done a risk assessment on uh, the assets that they need to fund on an emergency basis, and they're comfortable. Their recommendation was to uh, that this did not deplete their cash reserves in in. in, uh, in, in um, they were comfortable with that. But if, if they were wrong, though, I'm saying, if, if they were wrong and their reserves are dangerously low, how does that affect Littleton? The case of default Something from Inglewood. I think on that, it, how, how would we move, continue to move forward with this, or how, what would our options be? Uh, I misunderstood. Yeah. yeah. Well, I think from a from a legal aspect. Um, I think as far as Inglewood's reserves, I don't feel like they have an impact um, on Littleton or on our rates because we have an obligation to provide service based on our rates because we own 50% of the plant. I think Inglewood would be challenged with uh, determining how they're going to make up any shortfall that potentially might be there. Um, and I'm sure the attorney might be able to add to that. And to sort of take that further, this really isn't so much a question of what happens to Inglewood if it doesn't have adequate reserves. The question that would come up would be if Inglewood's reserves were so insufficient it couldn't meet its portion of the financial obligations. Uh, under the uh, agreement, at which point the city would invoke its rights under the agreement, uh, and that may mean that us and Inglewood might be on the opposite sides of uh, the courtroom, but uh, ultimately that's what we would do. Now, the fact of the matter is, uh, I think Inglewood has satisfied itself that it can do this within its level of reserves, but that would be the ultimate answer would be that uh, we would enforce the terms of the agreement on how we share expenses, and we would expect that Inglewood would pay its share of the expenses. <coughs> Thank you. And just a final, I want to kind of close. Um, we, uh, we, so we're here giving you an update on the, our proposed financing approach going forward. The, this project will become, will go from design to construction or anticipating third quarter of this year. And at that time, we will be going to Inglewood's council and asking them to approve uh, a contract with a renewable, uh, uh, with a RIN broker. And that gets to council member phase. In order to capture the RINs, this has to be given, this has, to, the, the gas has to be transferred for transportation uses, that's what the RIN broker does. They come in, they move the get, they move the particles of gas through Excel's pipeline and sell them to transportation providers. So that's a that's a contract we will be coming back with. We need to connect to Excel Energy and have an interconnect agreement. So that agreement 
uh, will be coming back to Inglewood Council, uh, and then we need to purchase this gas cleaning equipment uh, and hire a construction contractor to build the pipeline and install that gas cleaning equipment. And so, uh, because that's in Inglewood's uh, budget this year, uh, we would be going to them for approval of those contracts and that appropriation at that time. It's my understanding that Littleton has not appropriated that in the 2018 budget, but would you mind kind of commenting on the approach for uh, for, Ingl uh, for Littleton going forward? Then? So uh, last fall, um, if you recall, council, uh, we did propose to include the $4 million in the city of Littleton's portion of the sewer fund appropriation, and uh, council made the decision at that time to remove that from the 2018 budget. So what that means is that we would have to come back to you with an increase in the appropriation of the sewer fund in order to pay for our share of the uh, building of the biogas project. The two mil. Uh, the four mil. Two. And it was my understanding at, in, at supervisory committee that, that staff felt that that could be done in advance of going to Inglewood's council for these final approvals. Is yes, that, yes. I, I think as long as we have the information that council needs to make that uh, yeah. uh, approval, then um, we can do that probably at any time. And, and the appropriation is coming from the sewer fund only, it not is. from our... Just the sewer yes, fund. Just the sewer that would be the intent, I think, would be that come solely from the sewer enterprise uh, and not from any other fund. Mayor, Mayor just mm -hmm. so confirm for me there, John, so that uh, the final agreements looks like and the appropriations is the third quarter of this year. So we, we got all that list there. So that's when you would be asking our council to appropriate the additional funds. Is that correct? Yeah, or we or, or sooner. Or sooner. Yeah, no, certainly no later than this. No later. Certainly better, no later than this. Better said. And I think, and I'm just going to speak, I think for uh, Inglewood will be looking for, uh, I think it would help Inglewood to to approve these if they knew that Littleton had appropriated that money so in sooner. advance of that. So I think it would be advantageous to, <laughs> to have Littleton's confirmation of uh, cash financing and the appropriation in advance of in advance of this. Okay, so sooner rather than later. Yes, that would so be. what you are asking us today is to approve appropriation and to well we can't approve it here, but to no. move it to a meeting to approve and to um, to select the financing. Yeah, we're, we're looking for confirmation that cash financing is the, is the best approach, and then uh, uh, Littleton staff will be coming back with uh, a request for appropriation following this meeting. We, we just want to make sure we're, we're going in the right direction with this financing okay, well, approach. What does, a, what, does what, what, what does it look like to you to have uh, us give a direction on the financing tonight? We can't vote. Okay. So, what does that look like? Well, I can, oh, oh, yeah, please. Um, I would suggest that uh, if the council is comfortable here with this recommendation, that we place this uh, actually be an ordinance change to appropriate. So yes. you're going to have the first reading of an ordinance to set a hearing, then the public hearing itself then would actually change, would appropriate the funds in the sewer fund. So we could do that here, you know, in the, in the short term. This month we could certainly start that process. So that's what it would look like. I would like Tiffany to comment a little bit about the discussion we did have with the previous council about the impact here to the sewer fund and how that affected the rates. So I think over the five-year projection. Right. Um, so we did come to council uh, back in August with some projections based on cash funding, partially debt funding, or fully debt funding. And uh, as it relates to the rates, by cash funding, it, it really doesn't have that big of an impact to rates. Um, I believe we were estimating 1% uh, in 2019, a uh, potential 1.5 in 2020, 1.5 in 2021, and 1.5 in 2022. And um, that's cash funding it, and uh, with a four-year uh, payback on the $4 million share of the project for City of Littleton. I think what it also does is... It allows for us looking into the future after year, after a five-year fiscally constrained budget. And with these rent credits potentially coming in, and I felt like I was very conservative on future rent credits, I essentially dropped them by about 25% after year 2022. 
um, just to be a little more conservative. And I still feel that it's not going to impact rates uh, as, as much as you might imagine, at about maybe 0.5%, if that, um, depending on which uh, financing method we use. And I think the bigger issue is I feel I was conservative on revenue estimates after year four. But um, let's say that the run credits continue. Um, all that will do is that will positively impact any future uh, increases to rate payers because this is going to definitely offset any potential future increases. It may allow us to keep it flat. It may allow us um, to go up only slightly compared to where we might be going up 5 or 7% in the future. So maybe said in, in a different way is that once this project pays itself back, then there's a steady revenue stream that would come back to the sewer funds. The city would split that, right. in essence then reducing the, um, the need for us to raise rates over the future. So that's why we've been interested in this here for you know, at, least, at least a year. Carol? Oh, I, so, so many <coughs> tales on this thing. Uh, first on the technical aspect, um, I, after I retired from Honeywell, I worked for the world's largest boiler manufacturer, Wiesman, and uh, Wiesman sold boilers that uh, processed biogas. And um, doing the bids on those was extremely difficult uh, because it's, it's uh, even though it sounds like you're just processing waste gas, it's it's very complicated to get all of those pollutants out of there, and then what do you do with them? Um, how do you not uh, follow the equipment while you're doing it then? That was outside of Seattle, so <laughs> it comes together there. Um, it's, and, and the equipment was extremely expensive. And it turned out to be the hardest part of it was the people who were looking to buy the equipment didn't have the technical expertise in their existing staff um, to maintain the equipment. Um, so uh, I'm not comfortable that that's been addressed. It's just kind of put up there. But we might have to hire um, additional people with very high technical expertise. Another, I'm just throwing that out as another unknown. If I may comment on that, uh, I, I just came from, uh, we just commissioned a, a wastewater facility in Brighton, a 24 million gallon a day facility that had uh, gas conditioning uh, prior to cogeneration. Uh, same technology, uh, exact same systems. Uh, we operated that facility very successfully with the staff we had, very minimal training. Uh, these are these. Uh, I do not doubt your experience. There are gas conditioning and cleaning <coughs> systems that get very elaborate, but for biogas applications uh, tied to wastewater, th this is a very robust technology and is actually very operator friendly. We, we, we don't have those. We don't share those same concerns. How, how, long, how long ago since you were in the, that field? Two years ago. So maybe technology well, moving and, that fast. And not all gas streams are the same, right. and, I, and I think that's a really important distinction. And so there are gas streams off of industries and uh, that, that I do believe are very complicated sure. and require a bevy of different technology approaches. But uh, I can tell you a very personal experience with uh, a, a digester gas cleaning equipment. Uh, it's very much within the wheelhouse of uh, wastewater operators' expertise. A completely different tale on this thing. Um, so far as I know, this has never been approved by council, that it was um, uh, taken forward by the supervisory committee. Mr. City Manager? I don't know if I'd characterize that. The council's approved placing it in the wastewater treatments and plants budget to do the this phase of the engineering, but as somebody explained there, we did not appropriate the funds to go beyond that. Okay. Right. That's, that's what So that, that preliminary engineering work was approved. It was. By, that was by what council. We and then I, I kind of had the idea that after that, there was a, that council had requested back in September uh, for a report to come probably from Englewood of um, looking into private uh, providers and uh, so to get other ways to do it than this. And has that happened? I think this is the intent. This is the presentation of the response to that request. Oh, okay, and it was found that this is the best way. I didn't see any numbers on the private. 
those numbers are, are summarized in um, that, that in this. Yeah, this 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 is what third party financing brings to the table. It brings you don't have to bring the capital forward. It does provide RIN risk. It shifts the RIN risk, the the market risk to that third party provider. But it comes at a cost of about 75% of your forecast mm -hmm. revenue. So the decision was to go with cash. We're rec that's what we recommended to supervisory committee. Supervisory committee has uh, endorsed that, and the city of Inglewood also has uh, is moving forward with that decision as well. Or, or subject to a final appropriation uh, in third quarter. And then included in that is what the cash does not earn when it's pulled out. I assume it's, it's invested right. in earning now. Yes, we reduce the uh, future investment earnings uh, because we wouldn't have the four million. It said nine million, didn't it? Was it nine million that you reduced? For the well, the, the return was for yeah, the bill. Yeah. I'm just no. the four million that we wouldn't have on hand to earn interest on. Right. So that's included. Yes. That was the adjustment. Yeah. The thing that bothers me most about this is uh, generally we're not supposed to use taxpayer money in risky investments and even though I hear assurances all around and hurry up and buy it before it goes away, <laughs> um, that, uh, that it's a big unknown what happens in the RIN market. RINs are intangibles and they could go poof very quickly, very quickly. Yeah, we don't have any insurance, again, that they even exist until, thank you for the correction, 2022. Um, it, it could be completely gone, and our money could be completely gone. I think it's... Well, in that case, you... Uh, you're interrupting me. Go for it. Um, ask her for your turn. Go ahead. Yeah. Oh, okay. Well, you, you don't finish. want to wait? No. Go ahead. Finish. Exchange. <laughs> um... I lost my train of thought completely. Go ahead. Go nuts. In the risk. No, I was going to just say on the risk piece, that's when you say then let's let the risk uh, investors take that risk away from us. You know, so that's an alternative. Mm -hmm. uh, when, when was this RFP done? Or was, was it an RFP to come up with a budget? Or to come up with the budget? There, there was a request for information to characterize the private the P3 market. Okay. And so we did it in a two-step process. So it was a request for information first. And if the information looked, if some of the terms were shorter right. and some of the financials looked better, we could have then converted that into a request for proposals at that point. And actually, uh, we would have gone to the second step and actually gone back out to market. Yeah. And we're not recommending doing that. But we did the first step, which is the request so, for So the $8 million, is that... A fix, just a fixed number that's good for now until whenever? Or? That's based on the preliminary design phase. Is That's the number that, uh, that, that we're currently estimating. This contract that, the, that both cities have approved for final design, that will refine that number. We will actually go out to bid. We will actually get quotes gotcha. for all the equipment, and we hope mm -hmm. to refine that number so that it's, it's much. That will be part of that subsequent presentation. Right. Right. Yeah. And, and finally, is it, is it your feeling that that gas will be 100% uh, viable? Yeah, I, I'm going to state my, my professional opinion right. is getting into the renewable natural gas market, which this project allows the wastewater enterprise to do, will be a very good investment for both cities. We may not, the RIN market is variable, okay, and it's... Uh, it's written into legislation through 2022. It's going to take an act, uh, it's an administrative act of legislator to take it out. And so I don't think it, it disappears like that. that that's, a, that's, that's a lengthy process. This current administration has some time under their belt. If they were going to tackle this, our industry sources are saying they would have tackled this already. So we feel the RIN market is viable to pay this project off in the, in the current time frame of the RIN market. If we pay this asset off, it opens the door to renewable natural gas in a lot of different ways. Compressed natural gas is a, is a very viable market, and that's what you're seeing a lot on the front range. It wasn't viable for us right now because uh, neither city has a, has a CNG fleet at this point, uh, and our nearest existing fleet was several miles downstream. 
But that market will, we're, we're confident that market's going to evolve and there, uh, we think there will be other opportunities as, uh, as this project progresses and this investment in this asset will, 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 will produce and, dividends and, and, will, and will we have a, the rent broker, will that broker uh, be able to give us some idea, you know, some projections, I guess, uh, in, in your next report? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yep, absolutely. And that's, and that's part of getting them on board. Right, right. Marina? Um, Tiffany, I have some questions on the revenue assumptions. Mm -hmm. What, um, what are, so I, I've heard it's a net revenue number, meaning you've already accounted for the interest um, that we're not in, uh, accruing on the $4 million in cash. But if you can just educate me a little bit of what is in that revenue number, how does the RIN credits play into that? Um, and then second, if we were to, um, how can we mitigate the risk? So if the private investor is coming in so much lower, there is some assumption there of um, you know, how, how they're kind of Balancing that risk, should we have a scenario that you know that gives us kind of a range of if the RINs go away, here's where we'll be, and we're just to get a sense of how much risk are we really exposing ourselves to? Can, can I comment on that last one first? Sorry, the, this assumes the same RIN market. Their this their line is a different slope because of their reven their take of the revenue and their take of the upfront financing. And so the, the difference in these lines is not a different assessment of the RID market, it's an assessment of the, of the revenue sharing. So I wanted to just, I wanted to clarify that before you, before you answer your question. So. Thank you. Sure. I think as far as the RIN credits, um, like I said previously, I, I feel like I've been conservative um, because I've dropped it off in about year 2026. Um, assuming that, let's say, the RIN credits do go away. And um, I think I did, I think it was a total of about, um, it, it comes to about a million dollars a year. That, that's the four years that it takes to recoup that. And then I reduced it to about 750 and then about 500 and then about 250 in the So the portion out. of RIN credits to the total revenue numbers goes down over time. Right. The That's rent. how I've projected it. Now, if the RIN credits continue, and, and what's the percentage right now? Is it twenty percent is the credit, eighty percent is the? Um, well, it's about a million dollars of about sixteen million total. So I can't do that math in my head. It's small, but not a significant piece of it. Yeah. Is Excel our intended market? Excel is a distributor. Uh, and so we hire the RIN broker to actually uh, to distribute to the market. And what we've we've gotten a lot of interest. We've gotten a lot of calls from RIN brokers saying that there are the, the, the market to receive this from Excel's distribution network is very strong. And so uh, we, we we don't have any concerns about uh, tapping into the RIN market. The other thing I'd like to add is. So as part of the federal program through 2022, they, the, the, the federal government set goals and they set a total target of the market that they wanted to move these oil producers to renewable sources. They're, they are not meeting that target. And so that's, a, that's part of the reason the industry is so bullish on the RINs is these federal mandates or federal targets demand so far has been below that and so the, the market is still it, it's not like we're approaching the end of that market the, uh, and there's 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 a lot of hope that that market will stay viable until that demand is fully met John you might explain the what is actually in the written market so I know we've been talking about biogas specifically but the written market is far broader than that yeah so when we talk about federal legislation it's it's just a much bigger issue. I'm going right? to I'm going to ask our consultant who's been helping this okay. coal engineer to answer that more. I can tell I've been I've been got my blinders on. We're we're the cellulosic part of the market, but there's four different markets in the RINs, and cellulosic is what's derived wastewater production of biogas is in that cellulosic market. Yeah, and I don't even know offhand what the other two are, but I know ethanol is a big one. Um, so ethanol is huge, and that's one most investments are going to right now. CNG, yeah. There's not enough ethanol, so that opens up the room for 
Well, there, there is excess capacity in the ethanol. Well, there's five different categories. So we're looking at, I believe it's D3 is the, the um, category. category. Yes, and so ethanol, I think, is D1. I'm not 100% positive on that. I have, to, I have to pull up the report. That might be. have it here. But um, so ethanol has capacity. But the cellulosic, D3, has a lot of excess capacity because there's not as much biogas being generated. So landfills is one category that you're recouping uh, natural gas or biogas from that is being converted into rinse credits also. So that is the most common right now is landfill gas. Digester gas is relatively new um, in the market. But there's targets in each of those categories. And the, the target in the category, there's still quite a bit of demand in our target category. So, so the, the gases that you're, you're hoping to recover, what, it, they're just going into the air now? You're burning right. them. We're burning them right they're now. They're just going away. We're making zero dollars. Yep. So, yeah, yeah it, 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 probably not good pollution, I presume, no. too. I mean, not all pollution is bad. pollution. I presume this one's not good. So, so this goes into the other fuels that that really we get our power from the, the, the fuels that make these battery cars and things. Right, sure. right. so they, this is the fuel that is most dependable. So this is just a portion. What percentage of that would that be? That, the biofuels that we're adding to the... Question. I if I fill up my car with a tank of gas and it has this... Uh, at, at a national level, I, I would say... <laughs> I'm not, I, I, can't, I can't quote you a number, but I'm, I'm going to give you, it's the renewable portion of what you're getting at it is a, is a very small percentage. The federal government is trying, because it's a sustainable investment, uh, where they're trying to stimulate markets as well, they're trying to grow that percentage. And so don't quote me on this number. So if it's 5% now, they're trying to like grow it to like 10%. And that's but the yeah, whole, that's the whole. The idea that it would grow though, that's, I mean, that's what we're hoping for. They're growth. hoping to grow. Because I don't think the magic bullet's going to be invented within the next 10 years. Yeah. So, okay, cool. Thank you. And there's a lot of supply untapped, you know, land exactly. 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 coming online. Right. Right. Who do we sell this to? We, that's what the, the, we don't know that yet. That's that's where we're hiring the RIN broker to actually distribute it, but it's typically petroleum companies. And so, uh, who well, some you, of the people we've been talking to? Let me rephrase that. So you are selling the gas to Excel Energy. They are then going to push the gas, theoretically, to other places. And you mean as a, as a transport? It. Yes, as a transport. Yeah. And the gas companies that are producing petroleum get credits for buying your gas that's transferred into the Excel pipeline. So that's really how it works. There's no governmental funding for this program. It's a credit that each petroleum manufacturer has to have 7 to 10% of renewable gas in their portfolio. It's already gone up 2%, Joe. Well, I, I, I don't know what the number is, but I'm just using that. Range. What's so, the going go again? Does that make sense? So it's a, it's a different market. The rent and the gas are separate. It's yeah. the credit market. It's, well, it's kind of akin to affordable housing credits. Right. So right. The credits are different than the actual stock or gas. So, so oh. Excel's very excited to do this. They've had a lot of interest. And uh, Eric Cluck, uh, at sorry, City of Inglewood, City of Inglewood's manager, talked Eric Keck. Keck, sorry. Yeah. Uh, talked oh, to the clock. city. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I talked to this uh, Excel earlier this week, and they said they're very excited about moving forward with this project. And who would be our competition? Who are we competing against? Do we have any competition? Well, you're you're competing. There's a set there's a set supply or a set uh, target volume for the these biogas credits. So we're competing for others who have this as a supply. Them getting to the market. It's um, it's it's not. I, I don't think it's a. I don't, I don't think it's a traditional competing. In a sense, ethanol is a competitor. If there's enough ethanol, which there isn't right now, but if there were, then we would need biogas to to fulfill the requirement. Right. Yeah, but, but he's nodding. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> but but not where we're at right now. Uh, uh, too uh, well. I, I think um, my opinion is. The market for renewables is so large right now that that yes that is a that is a potential concept, but that's that's 
That's not in our lifetimes, I think. Kyle. Um, I, I think, you know, cleaning the air, yeah. increasing revenue, or getting revenue from our waste, basically, um, it's, it's, it's a no-brainer to me, and the, the question is financing. The fact that we have the money, yes, there is a risk, but there's a risk in everything that we do every day. I mean, there's a risk in widening a road or a sidewalk or buying a snowplow, um, you know. So I think the um, returns far outweigh that risk, and I don't necessarily see that risk as that huge of a risk that we are, you know, this is a, a very risky investment. We're rolling the dice and hoping it happens. It's, it's, it's a pretty good bet. So I think I, I'm, I'm fine with the uh, cash finance, and I think that we're not going to harm our uh, reserves doing that. And I think we'll go with that. Let's go around the room. Yeah. Yes, I think it would be a Thanks. great uh, question. Karina? Uh, yeah, I, I mean, when I look at if we are going to be spending money, let's spend it towards um, an investment. That's what I see this at. Um, so um, I think it's a solid proposal. Carol, I'm very uncomfortable with this not voting, voting, and uh, with the fact that this is the, I think, the first time that council has voted on this sort of thing. We're not voting. Uh, I know we're not voting, but it sure feels like voting. We're, and we're so, making uh, a decision to direct staff. Yeah, I, I understand. I'm saying I'm very uncomfortable with it. Okay. And, uh, and so... Uh, say no because I'm very uncomfortable with the process. Jerry? I'm a non-tree hugger, that's for sure. No? <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm for it. Let's do it. Okay, so council has, um, you have consensus from council to prepare an ordinance. Okay. What do we get, 6-1? So, is that what my little Peggy's voice over there? You no. don't have that. I yeah, can't, I can't. Gave I, yeah, yes, Jerry. I can't tell you <laughs> talking to the mic anymore, you know. Okay. <laughs> Uh, Debbie, just to address what, you know, Carol and the process, so what what we're just asking here is that it, it, it gets on the agenda right. for an ordinance, so we're going to go through a formal diligence and process and make a decision at that point. It'll be a so first and second reading, right. so there'll be a public hearing. We have there, you, you know, in order to get things to the dais, there needs to be a consensus from council, there needs to be four people that are mm -hmm. want to move it otherwise nothing moves or everything moves so um, you have you want to you really want to talk about the logo all right it, it should be quick but I don't have okay. the I, it's on a different oh. I need we have it yeah, I need some else. else okay so just very quickly we are not the wastewater name, the wastewater brand, has served us well for 40 years. We're transitioning to, there are more com competing demands on the water that we produce. That's going to force us to look regionally and partner regionally and plan regionally. And so, and, and we need to think, we need to get this waste mentality out of our vernacular. We are actually renewing water for our community's needs. And along the way, like the biogas project, we're recovering <coughs> and trying to market the resources that we're treating along those processes. And so we're looking at rebranding, which includes mission, visions, and values, but it gets sort of culminated in a logo and a name. And we're choosing the South Platte, we're recommending the South Platte Water Renewal Partners. Partners? The original partnership between Littleton and Inglewood. We're also looking to partner in the South Platte Basin in the region. Water renewal, I think I've explained that one very well. South Platte Basin, yes, we serve the cities of Littleton and Inglewood, and we're super proud of that. But we also serve 19 other connector districts, and we also serve all of the communities that are, that are built around the South Platte watershed. I think this is just an acknowledgement of the work that each of these cities have done for the past 40 years and the work they're going to keep doing going forward in serving the South Platte watershed, not just, not, and, and the cities are included in that broader watershed. So that's the, that's the brand that we're recommending going forward. And I would just ask um, for some clarification. This is, this is not a policy decision. You are just sharing this with We're us. We're sharing this information, yep. 
But, um, you know, we are policy makers, so this yep. is not something that we can tell you, ah, I don't like the shade of green, but it doesn't matter. Okay. Okay. Actually, one more question. Sure. How did, did Ingwood have uh, many concerns? Uh, are you able to share that? Or I am. Uh, I think the biggest concern, the biggest feedback we got last night is around the tagline. The tagline says that it's serving uh, Littleton. Well, not this. I, I'm it's not, it's part of, no, no. Uh, all backwards. Yeah. No, the, oh, well, on the biogas? Yeah. Um, Sorry. Yeah, I, I like this one. Well, let, me, <laughs> let me finish that thought. They had some okay. concerns about the tagline, uh, serving Middleton, Inglewood, and beyond. Right. They wanted to express more ownership, like uh, you know, like powered by Littleton, Inglewood, or uh, a Littleton, Inglewood joint venture. That feedback went to the city manager of Inglewood. Uh, he's going to bring that back to the supervisory committee. So I do think there might be a subtle tweak to the tagline. Would we support... I, I had the same reaction, okay. so it's interesting that they... I, I feel like we're just like everybody else. I hear, yeah. So, and, and we have much more ownership yep. in this, and we should claim it. Yep, I think we're, the risk, we're the risk holders. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and I think that subtle change would do that. As far as on the biogas project, uh, we did get some feedback that there was some desire for the P3 because it, it is a full risk transfer. Uh, but uh, uh, we were moving forward, going to present a cash finance project to Inglewood uh, later this year. So that was the that was the overall direction. Great. Do you need anything else? From us? No, I really appreciate all the feedback and your time. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you, Thank Thank you for your presentation. Okay, um, Council. Our next item is lift recommendations, and if everybody's okay, we'll just go ahead right on in to it, unless somebody needs a break. Nope. Okay. So, y'all received um, the applications that Jerry and I had received um, regarding the lift applicants. And I want to go through just real briefly with you. I'm going to pass around. Let's see. Questions that were asked. And so, you'll have those. Just pass those down. Um, and then I have a document here that I'm going to share with you, but I want to walk through it real briefly. You guys will cut to the, to the last bit. <laughs> um, Jerry and I wanted to share with you a little bit about our process and a little bit about <coughs> um, kind of what we, what we were thinking. Um, our interviews were conducted in a public setting, as we um, promised and, and made a, an amendment to. Um, we conducted the interviews January 18th and 19th, and all the candidates were asked the same questions and given the same information. We had two citizens observe the interviews both days. Um, then we met on January 20th, Jerry and I met on January 20th, to deliberate and reach our recommendations. Our decisions were based primarily on the criteria that I've listed here. And while the criteria is somewhat subjective, it served to guide our decisions in a thoughtful way that allowed us to reach full consensus on our final choices. Recognizing that there are nuances in interviews that can influence decisions, we, believed the, we believe those influences were not used in determining our recommendations. We appreciate the opportunity to present these candidates to the entire council, and we look forward to answering any questions. Please note that we ask that the discussion tonight focus on our recommendations. We are happy to engage in a conversation about the reasons these <coughs> citizens were selected, but we prefer not to embark on a discussion on why others were not. Out of respect for our citizens, we will keep this conversation positive and supportive. The criteria, the primary criteria that we used, one, we some understanding of land use, zoning, and comp plan, and how they work together. Some experience or knowledge of the primary components of redevelopment and urban renewal. An understanding of financing mechanisms. It was not necessary, but it was a plus. We wanted someone, obviously, who was going to be a team player. These folks are going to have to work together. Um, we wanted someone who was interested in the success of urban renewal. Um, good communicator and someone obviously who's going to be available for the meetings and understand that the workload may increase. Um, please note that all of the candidates indicated a strong love of Littleton and a desire to give back in service to their community. 
So that was across the board. Um, I would also say that Jerry and I, again, you know, for those of us that have gone through board and commission yeah. interviews, we're always just so kind of taken back by the high high level of skills and the quality that we have in Littleton, and these, we again experienced that. It was it was we probably could have picked any one of them, and and it's just we were very we always are we're like wow these people. So no doubt we left some great talent on the table, and for those that weren't appointed, we will encourage their applications to any of our other boards and commissions. We felt a couple of the candidates would be excellent on any one of our quasi-judicial boards, and uh, we would look forward to seeing them again in February. And, and a couple of them did comment that they had um, had some ideas on some other boards too. So um, I will go ahead and pass this. Is is essentially what I just read to you, but I wanted to say it aloud for the record also. Um, our new appointees that we're recommending are Jack Rychecki for a term ending 2021, Cindy Christensen with a term ending 2020, and Joseph Arena with a term ending 2020. We're also recommending that we reappoint Kevin Saylor for a term ending 2023, and Nicholas M Millar for a term ending 2023. And they were both, they have both served on the lift board a year, and they, their term expired in 2018, so they resigned early so that we could fill those positions in. Jerry and I felt as though these guys, um, both of them were, they're very committed to continuing to work on the, on the lift board. They they have spent a year kind of going through um, the processes and kind of the housekeeping of it because there hasn't been a project. And now that there's a project in the potential in the future, they are hoping to see their, <laughs> their work come to fruition. Um, I think that one of the things that they both indicated was how much they would like to continue learning. And in terms of um, more experiences on the lift board to help bring them up to a state of knowledge regarding urban renewal. And so um, it was, it, Jerry and I both felt that these guys had put in some time and had done some work and that they wanted to come back and they wanted to do more and they wanted five years. So that's what these terms are. And we are appreciative of that, appreciative of their service, and so we would like to have them. So we will, Gary, do you want to add some of your I thoughts? do. I want, I want to add that we are unanimous. There, there was really little discussion on who to point out. one fight? That that was, uh, yeah, but. <laughs> there wasn't. It was. <laughs> yeah, right, yeah. But, uh, yeah, we, we are unanimous on all, on all five. It was the other candidates not appointed where, that's what we talked about. What the heck do you do with those folks? Because they were so many this talented folks. So uh, yeah, they, uh, and I, I think these the three new, I think are all experienced folks that'll really contribute. Jack brings an incredible amount of finance exactly. to it, and his experience in banking and stuff we thought was great. Cindy brings a great a depth of knowledge on development, urban renewal, economic development. Um, and Joseph, he has, he's an attorney who has a, uh, an interesting background, but he also has a great passion for public service. And he also has, um, I thought, a, a nice understanding of, of where we are um, and development. And he has, grew up in Littleton and went away and did college and stuff and then came back and has um, moved here with his wife and raised his family here. So. Any comments or questions? I like the variety of each of the, at least the new members that you chose. You have finance, you have um, kind of urban planning to a certain degree, and um, and then some legal. So I think it's, because that's one of the challenges with Lyft, if there, there's so many aspects of the decisions that are being made and different strengths and skill sets come in. 
um, throughout its full life cycle. So I like that approach. Yeah, having another legal beagle in the room is not always my favorite thing. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So if there's no additional discussion, then we will have staff bring this back to us at our next meeting. Will we? Uh, no. Have these or cannons been amendment. notified? No, we haven't. No. no. They will and not until we vote next week. How about if there is a change in somebody's circumstance? Do we have? Do you have a second or a, a sixth and seventh choice? Um, or well, guess, you know, so we'd hope to do an alternates, but yeah. it's just not allowable. We had a couple candidates at the time. Yeah, that, okay. so you're not too concerned. Will, will you bring that back if somebody has to decline on unexpectedly? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I don't think that we would have to read. I don't think that we would need to open it up for applications again. Right. We have Seven of uh, qualified, yeah, qualified folks. Yeah, right. yes. five of those are, are incredibly. No. Yeah, if somebody go ahead and submit another name, if there for some reason the uh, person the kind. Okay. What was that again? The mayor could simply go ahead under the statute and say, for example, oh. one of these people declined. The mayor could simply submit another name to fill in that place. Yeah. Okay, so we are now at your little corner and you get four minutes. <laughs> I'm just glad to be back. We are glad you Welcome are back. back. <laughs> just a couple of quick comments here. So um, you, I think we're trying to give council a little bit of a, a heads up here. If we have an item coming to your next regular meeting here, we've got a couple of vacation of, of equestrian easements that are a little unusual. Yeah. Uh, that you'll see on the agenda and uh, hopefully the detail of that will explain all this but we've had requests from the property owners for us to release those easements so as you look at that again they're really unique if you have questions please just let me know um, and on, uh, Mark, just yes. to add, this is being brought forward by those property owners Correct. the other thing i wanted to mention is that one of the one of the challenges i think that i have been looking at here internal to um, our operation is our development review process. And so I've had uh, several conversations with Keith Reister, our public works director, and Jocelyn Mills, our community development director. And so we actually have a consultant that I'd like to bring on and actually do this kind of analysis within the development review process. So public works, community development, and to kind of map our processes and then look for best management practices to kind of uh, fine-tune that. I think what I'm hearing is that a real concern, not only from the development community, but the lack of predictability about our process. And so I want to address that, quite honestly, from our residents as well. They have a difficult time understanding our own process. And so I think it's quite honestly, I, I believe that it's uh, critical for us to make this assessment to move this forward. We do not have the expertise or the time or the resource internal for us to do the work. Now, I have funds appropriated within professional services between the two departments, so I don't necessarily need an appropriation for that. I mean, it's about probably less than $60,000. So I have the authority uh, within our policies for me to uh, just to go ahead and do this work, but I wanted to at least notify you that we're going to be proceeding with this. Yeah, this is FYI. You could go out and do it without us. I can. I can do that. But I have to be honest, this, this is, in my opinion, is probably one of the most critical things that we can do internally to this organization uh, because our reputation, both by the development community and our own citizens, I think we're a little <coughs> bit at risk here, and I want to address that. The last thing is, you know, we, uh, we did put in place kind of this new emergency notification process. Yeah, it works. Yes. <laughs> red alert, red alert. I'm sorry. I Wait, my work was delayed two hours, but it wasn't. <laughs> I was like, damn. I, <laughs> it's a new system, and so we did want to test it, and we, uh, you know, with this recent snow, we did have a delayed start here, and I didn't realize that some of council was tied to that, so I apologize if you got a very early morning Yo. phone call and text message. <laughs> Um, you are to get an email, by the way, but not not the uh, early morning phone call. I didn't get a phone call or a text. I just got the email. It didn't ring. I just got the message. Oh, yeah. Okay. I got it. Yeah. All right. Well, work for me. You know who's the important council members now, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> it is not so much uh, notification in case we have a kind of you know difficult road.
road conditions, but we are looking longer term here to try to implement kind of a emergency management policies throughout the organization so we can <coughs> respond to, uh, you know, kind of the emergencies here, whether they're natural disasters or like train derailments or other kinds of emergencies. So we're trying to put a deeper process in place here. And so this was one step, and we had a trial with that. And for the most part, it went great, so I apologize if you got it. Did, did staff, everybody? Uh, not everybody got it, and so that was part of the test. So we did have a few employees who did not get notified for one reason or another, and so that's why we that's wanted to play that That's because they came out. to us instead. <laughs> yes, so yeah. we're working out those bugs. Yeah. Most part of it was pretty good. Yeah, good. Yeah. Oh, that's Apart from okay, just two housekeeping things. Thursday we have our breakfast with South Suburban. It is here. Um, would you make sure Council gets that agenda? Um, absolutely, that? yeah. I will here first thing tomorrow morning. Thanks. And then we are we will have a workshop agenda for you next week. A meeting with Kevin this week. Which I think is it's almost the end of the um, and so we're going to put the put that all back all together, and so we'll have that for you guys. It's it will be it will be small, but it will be large. It will be <laughs> it will be few issues, but they are very very big. How many hours is that? Uh, we are at this time starting the workshop at eight, and we would like to be concluded by three thirty. So we will have, there will be some level of breakfast there, so grab it, and, we, and then there will be lunch served, and we will make, probably make it a working lunch. And it's at the vault. So be comfortable, dress comfortable. Amen. Okay, I, Karina. I, I will make it super quick. Um, so Dr. Cog has made a few, we've made a few decisions there, and then there's also some information I'm gonna just pass along. There is a winter, this is the first year, it's a winter bike to work, so I don't know if this is information that we also try to share through the city of Littleton and make it available, or? We have in the past, yes. So I'm making you aware if this is something to share with um, Kelly to help um, distribute that information. Um, there has also been a data request, and I don't know if, um, Keith, you might have gotten this. So this is, the, as you know, uh, Dr. Cog does a really great job on setting goals and tracking data, et cetera. So they need our help and everybody's help to do that. Um, and then there was a, um, one of the decisions that uh, was an important change in how Dr. Cog is um, managing the uh, funding that's federal funding that's coming in and then what projects it goes to it was um, up until now centrally managed with the uh, within Dr. Cog um, and uh, the decision that was made was that that was going to be pushed down at a more sub regional level and that decision uh, was taken to a vote um, this past week generally speaking it's an 80 20 split which means 20 percent stays at the high level regional 80% is coming down at the sub-regional. Some of the advantages that we have from that is sub-regionals organized by counties, and lucky us in this case, we're in three counties. Sometimes that works to our advantage, so maybe sometimes to our disadvantage. So in this case, um, that just gives us, you know, we, we have a seat at the table in various discussions, and it allows a lot more collaboration in the areas that affects um, more than one jurisdiction. So. Good news, um, more to come from the Arapaho Transportation Forum, which is the entity that's been um, put together to help manage um, this process and the, this funding. Feel free to reach out to me if you want to learn more about this. I'll share this lovely packet. <laughs> And if I may, I just want to reinforce that, you know, the new model that Dr. Cog adopted is the one I patterned after this, the Seattle or Puget Sound Regional Council of Governments. Mm -hmm. And I, of course, worked that for eight years. Quite honestly, I am thrilled with this decision. I think it has much more meaning for Littleton to participate on an annual basis for grant opportunities. And so I, I'm just thrilled. Then we are too. Yes, excellent. Good. Order. <laughs> Thank you.
Thank you.